I do, I do every day. <laughs> when you ain't got power, boy, let me tell you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I hear you. I wonder if Ronnie's feeling okay. He's not here today. How about everybody come in and stand up and uh, we're going to sing this handout. your blessings? Yeah. Okay. We got a new one we're singing, so everybody sing loud. It's a handout. Yeah, we might as well try them all. Good morning. Welcome out to church, everyone. It's good to see everybody. Before we open with prayer, we have answered prayer. We definitely count our many blessings. In speaking to Ronnie yesterday, just uh, so many answered prayer in the church here over and over. And uh, with the blessings that we, we all receive in Christ is just tremendous. First salvation, eternal life, and just the answered prayer that we see we receive every single day. Um, so... 
Uh, Jenny Lundeen, she was uh, discharged from the hospital about a week, and uh, she, had, she, she had cerebral leakage, and uh, they sent her home, I think it was about last Thursday or Friday, and uh, so the brain tumor's removed, the brain fluid has stopped leaking, she's home, and uh, so that's answered prayer. We just need to continue to pray for Jenny, and we need to continue to pray for mom and dad, Doug and Jan. Um, is there any other prayer, prayer requests this morning before we open with prayer? Jim? Yes. So their daughter has an infection? Okay. Uh, what? Trisha. Trisha. Okay. Any other uh, prayer requests? Yes. Any others? Yeah, Chad. Any others? Edwin? Yes. Okay, let's open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, first of all, we just want to thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy, that you loved us sinners the way we are, and that you sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, sent him in the flesh and he went to the cross and he died on the cross of Calvary, dying for all the sins of mankind, past, present, and future, and then being buried, showing that he paid that ultimate price for all of our sin. And then three days later, he triumphantly resurrected from the grave, showing us the payment for sin is paid in full. And the only way to go to heaven is believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, burial, and resurrection. We're trusting in Jesus Christ to save us. That is the only way to heaven. It's not about being good. It's not about asking Jesus in your heart, taking communion, or any other salt, false ritual or sacrament or any type of uh, works for salvation. It is simply by faith in the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ. So, Father, if there's anybody here today maybe is not, doesn't understand the gospel, that they would hear it today, and today they would be born again. Today they would receive Christ. And Father, to your children that you're here today, we just ask that the body that's represented here this morning, to the believers in Christ, that we obviously through the singing and through the reading of the word, that they would be nourished by the word, that we would be ultimately lifted up, and that our minds would be uh, like Christ, that we would mature in Christ. And Father, we just sat here today and we can count our many blessings over and over the answered prayer that we receive. The people that are healed through prayer, it's just unbelievable. Over the years, we see the cancer that's been removed from the bodies of people. And ultimately, Father, we do this. It is because of who you are. You're the God of grace. You're the God of love. And, and ultimately, you're the one that's magnified through this because you're the one that does all the healing. And we're so thankful that we have a loving Father in heaven and our intercessor Christ that ultimately goes to the throne of grace on our behalf every single day. What a privilege we have in Christ. So, Father, as we gather here today, we boldly come to you again through Christ. We pray for Jenny Lundeen. We just pray that you continue to address her health needs, Father, keep her safe and secure. And we pray for Mom and Dad as Mom battles cancer herself. We just pray that you continue to give that family comfort, strength, nourishment, and ultimately just uh, we're so thankful for the answered prayer for that family. We pray for Kathy, I'm sorry, uh, Kathy and Arnie's daughter for an infection, Father. We just pray that you would remove this infection from her and give assurance to mom and dad that things are going to be just fine, but we're so thankful that she's in the hands of down in the cities, and we know that you do provide healing through the doctor's father, so we just ask that you continue to keep her safe, comfort her, and heal her as she's down in the cities. We pray for little Gracie, who has an infection also. We just pray that you keep her safe and secure and keep her comfortable and pain-free and address any medical issues we ha she has. We pray for Grandma Marge, just a wonderful sister in Christ. We just pray, Father, that you, know, you bring her medical issues 
under a, a dress that you bring her blood pressure down, Father, and we just pray that you continue to provide her comfort and keep her pain-free also. We pray for Edwin's mom and dad and Missy's mom and dad, Fritzy and Mary Ellen. We know that Mary Ellen is uh, ultimately wheelchair-bound at this time, Father, so we just pray that you continue to address her medical needs, Father, and that you continue to give that family strength and comfort as only you can. And Father, we're just again thankful for this church and the people that come out here today. We're just uh, so thankful for this body that's represented here where we can continue to give glory and magnify you what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. And Father, we just ask that you bless this message and bless the singing today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me turn to page 98. We'll do all of them, all three. This is kind of a new one, so sing loud and help us out. are you, Paisley? Three? Three? Showing <laughs> we got one more here. How old is she? Six. Oh. Uh-oh. Oh, another one there. Where? I'm not even going to ask you. So I'll leave that alone. <laughs> 
Okay, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. You know, after uh, speaking at the assistant livings, I, I uh, put my foot in my mouth quite a bit. So anymore, I just say young ladies <laughs> because, you know, I can't harm myself that way. But uh, anything else, I got to dig my foot back out. And it, that's hard to do for a guy. Really hard. But uh, let's sing page 387. This is a new one, too. I think Kim was trying to punish us. So. But uh, it's a pretty song, so everybody help us out. We might as well do them all. singing because I wasn't singing <laughs> so we got t-shirts lots of them downstairs uh, if you got friends family members uh, out of state what a great gift it's a great uh, testimony witness tool I mean when you wear the Lord's Army shirt John 3.16, Philippians 4.13 on the back. Somebody makes the comment all the time, so it's a great opportunity to share. And uh, it's a great, a lot of, lot of shirts downstairs for gifts. So, so you can get with anybody down in the church here, and we'll show you downstairs, my wife, and we can definitely uh, show you the shirts if you're interested. Um, I don't want to say um too much. My wife will get mad. <laughs> Let's see here. Majestic Pines this morning. Kevin's going to be speaking. Kevin and Rebecca. Is Kevin here? Yeah, I thought I saw him. So Kevin's going to be speaking at Majestic, and I know Jack's going to be speaking next Sunday at Majestic. If you want to join either one of them. And a Manor House at 1 o'clock with Dennis and Kim. And let's see here. Youth group coming up November 26th at the Roller Rink. Everything's already scheduled. Reservations. We'll have pizza, soda for the kids. And uh, hopefully everybody come brings kids out. So I do have handouts, Jack, in the back. So if there's handouts there for the youth group, but I did make copies for Jack. And if anybody wanted, I made 10 copies. If anybody wanted, I handed them out to anybody. And then we have the Christmas program December 18th and potluck immediately after. Uh, is that it? Any other announcements this morning? Okay, last, uh, last song before the message. Page 323, uh, 1 and 4. <laughs>
And then I love uh, this verse here. It has nothing to do with the message, but everything to do with the song we just sang in Isaiah 6. It's in ch chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Then it drops down to verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will I who will go for us? And then said I, Here I am, send me. And John chapter 12 defines us who's that, who we're talking about here, and it is actually Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that he takes a coal off the altar, and ultimately it was where the lamb was sacrificed. And ultimately that's, that coal he touched to his lips ultimately cleansed him. And that's ultimately Jesus Christ cleanses us. And it's interesting that a coal comes from the altar, ultimately where Jesus Christ, or where the lamb was sacrificed. So when we sing songs like that, they are obviously scriptural and uh, very good. But it's, uh, if you want to look at Isaiah 6 and John chapter 12, you can definitely do it. I think it's John 12, 40 and 41 or 42. Anyways, look at Daniel chapter 10. Today's message is called the Word of Truth. If you're new here, uh, you know, I got a friend here and others here. and You know, you got coffee, cookies in the back. We got a uh, uh, bathroom up front here downstairs. You know, feel free to make yourself at home. You can get up, move around, and uh, so you don't need to just sit there if you don't want to. Anyways, today's message is called the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's open a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, is just so amazed at the, the word of God. It is oftentimes referred to as the word of truth. And ultimately, we know Jesus Christ is truth. In a world that has no truth or doesn't understand what true is, it has no you know, understanding of anything of that, Thank God that we have the Word of God, that we have true definition of what truth is, what true is. And Father, we just ask that you'd speak to everybody here today, that they would understand the gospel, receive Christ today if they're not saved, and then to your children, that we would grow up and mature in Christ. So Father, we just ask that you bless this message and let, let the Word of truth obviously ring out through the service today. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel 10.1. Daniel in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and he had understanding of the vision. So we know in Daniel's time here, he already went under the Babylonian rule, the first 70 years. And now he's, we know in chapter 9, we reflected back, ultimately, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And here Daniel is given another vision. But the Daniel received a vision which was true. And here he says there's clear understanding. It wasn't obscure or needed to be interpreted. We know like on the Discovery Channel you'll see like Nostradamus and they have men well, that will interpret these things. But here it was clearly, didn't need any interpretation. There was a clear understanding of what the vision meant. So before we get into that, I want to talk about what is truth though. So this thing was true. And the question I have for all of us is, what is true? What is true? If you were to sit here today and you would define what true is, or if you were to define, define what truth is, what would you say? And ultimately, where would that come from? Where would the source of that be? Was it truth from mom or truth from dad? Or truth from grade school? Truth from middle school? Truth from a professor? Where does, who defined that truth or true? Webster defines, the Dictionary of 1828, Webster defines true as genuine, pure, real, not counterfeit, free from falsehood, honest, not fraudulent, exact, and right 
to precision, like machining, you know, what is true? Another question is, what is truth? Webster defines truth as a true state of facts or things, purity from falsehood, fidelity, constancy, honesty, and virtue. So what do you see as true or truth in your life? Who has defined true or truth in your life? And the question I have for you is, are you like Pilate? Where, is he, where Pilate says, what is truth? Are you so hardened by the world that you have no measure of what true or truth is? Have you been lied to over and over by man that you have no concept what is true or truth? In this world of man, there are no absolutes. For you start to believe the truth or believe something is true, and then you find it isn't what you thought it was. Over and over we see the history and science that we, these men will come up with laws and ultimately we find out later it's not true. Pro, you know, basically uh, hypothesis. That's what man does. Man does not live in absolutes like black and white. Even though we like to say we live, we have black and white, we, there is no black and white in man's world. Man lives in a world that has many shades of gray because there is no truth in the world. If you look at John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. When you have no truth in you, all you have is many shades of gray. When there are many shades of gray, there are no absolutes. And when there is no absolute, there is only lying. Romans 1.25 Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever? So you can be the dark shade of gray over here or you can be the lightest shade of gray that almost looks white. And it looks good on the outside and they say they preach grace. But you know what? Maybe when you get to the church, you know, they say your life actually has to show that you're saved. That's lordship salvation. And then it turns into a works for salvation, and ultimately it's not black or white, it's all these many shades of gray, because I'm telling you, the gospel is black or white. If you believe there's nothing true or no truth, and this is what they're teaching in, in, in colleges today. Nothing true or no truth, and only many shades of gray. If you believe that, ultimately you're going to have this thinking that we're all right. And nobody's wrong. And this viewpoint values unity versus truth. The view from the world has a systemic problem which dates back not only to Pilate, but the Garden of Eden. This worldview has no true concept. This worldview has no true measure of truth. But you know what? Thank God for Jesus Christ and thank God for the Bible because the Bible defines what true is and the Bible defines what truth is. If you look at John chapter 18, verse 37 and 38, it's at the illegal trial just before he's crucified. He's in front of Pilate. And he says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. So back to the first question. What is true? What is truth? The Bible is true, and in the Bible it speaks of truth. Look at Psalms 1, 19, verse 160. Thy word, that's verse 60, where we need one, 
60. Let me read this. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Thy word is true. So it might be a misprint in the announcements, but it's Psalms 119, 160. Now look at Colossians 1, 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. Look at Revelations 21, 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. His word is truth. His word is true. And it is the only thing that is an absolute black or white, and it does not have any shades of gray. Look at Romans 11:6. If you're sitting here today and you're not saved, and maybe you're angry at Jesus because, you know, man has done all these horrible things in the name of God to kids, adults, stole money, all of these horrible things in the name of God. Well, you know what? Be mad at man. Don't be mad at God. Because I'm telling you, you have a God that loves you just the way you are right now. And I'm telling you, look at this. This is an absolute. And he says, and if by grace then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, I know Jack had shared with us one time at Bible study, and he says, if you put in there black and white for grace and works, he says, and if it by white, then it is no more black. Otherwise, white is no more white. If it be of black, then it is no more white. Otherwise, black is no more black. See, grace is... And works are a black and white issue. There is no shades of gray. You are saved by grace through faith in the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Believe he died on the cross for your sins, burial, and resurrection. The work is already done for Jesus Christ. Completed the work. The redemptive work of all other works for salvation is an abomination. So any other works for salvation is abomination. In Proverbs 8, 7... And if you are a preacher of the gospel, this is what your, your lips. It says, for my mouth shall speak truth. And wickedness is an abomination to my lips. So if you're trying to earn salvation by doing good deeds, following the commandments, confessing sins to man, then my lips calls these works, works of wickedness, and they are an abomination unto the Lord, for there is no other salvation received other than in the name of Jesus Christ which is true, which is truth. And what a privilege we have here today to know we have salvation. We can hear the word of truth, which is true. Around the world doesn't have that privilege oftentimes. Let's look at some more word of God here that's defined by, by God. John 1.14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory and the glory of us as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, in Satan there is no truth. He immediately deceived Eve in the garden, ultimately telling her, thinking that she could be her own God. And ultimately Cain killed Abel. He offered up works for salvation. And 1 John tells us his works are all, were abomination. They were wicked. You cannot earn salvation. That's why Christ came, because he died a perfect sacrifice for each and every one of us. Look at John 1, 17. For the law was given by most, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So listen up. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died a death that you owe and that I owe. He revealed himself in the flesh because he loved us. He loved us so much that he died for each and every one of us. He was buried and he later resurrected to show us the payment for sin is paid in full. He paid the perfect sacrifice for sin. The Father accepted Jesus Christ's death payment for sin. The truth is you are a sinner and the truth is that you all deserve hell. We all do. And the only way to receive salvation is believe in the finished redemptive work of Christ. For Jesus Christ is truth. 
Now this is true. And I hope that you have received Christ. Hopefully you understand and you believe because Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Look at John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. See, man wants to pervert the word of God. Man wants to get up at the pulpit and pervert, you know, the messages and preach works for salvation and put himself up on a soapbox and think he's a little bit better than everybody else. If you could earn salvation in any other way, then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross for our sins? He come to do it to set us free. Ultimately, Jesus says in the prayer before he goes to the cross in John 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Make them holy through thy truth. Who is truth? Jesus Christ is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So in a world that has no absolutes of all, all many shades of gray, we have one thing. That is truth. So, the question is, are you going to sacrifice truth for unity? The world is teaching unity. The world teaches there are no absolutes for there are only many shades of gray. However, we have the Word of God telling us there is a black, it is a black and white issue. You're only saved by grace through faith in the finished redemptive work of Christ. So are you going to believe the Word of God, which is truth? Or are you going to believe the world system that has no truth in them? Let me be real clear. The Word of God separates. The Word of God separates. It comes to divide, for you can never preach unity without first teaching truth. If you teach unity first, you will never have truth. You must always start with the foundation. The foundation is truth. The Word of God is very clear that truth divides. Which side will you be on? Will you be on the side that knows no truth, or will you be on the side that knows truth? Look at Luke chapter 12. It is a black and white issue. Luke 12, 49 through 53. He says, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I, if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and now am straightened till it be accomplished. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nah, but rather division. For them henceforth there shall be in five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's what the word of God, word of God does. When you speak truth, it causes a division. Either you accept him by faith, you trust in the finished work, or you be like the world system that preaches all these works for salvation. And we started the message off, we're told to study the word of God, to rightly divide the word of truth. So let me speak to all the believers out there. Because it's important, I think, we need to have this discussion. Let's think hypothetical question that all the believers were all in heaven. And you notice that none of your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren are in heaven. What happened? Let's speculate for just a minute. The reason your children, grandchildren, and great-children are not in heaven is because they never accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you might have accomplished all these great things in the world, have the great job, drive, the, you know, drive all the multiple vehicles and have multiple places, but you know what? If your kids and grandkids and great kids aren't saved, what does it really matter? So the question is, do you think it's important to raise your kids on the gospel? Pastor Tom, I've been uploading his messages to the YouTube and ultimately to uh, Facebook. And one of the messages he has is, is church attendance important? I would say it's very important to come out and have fellowship with other believers, to sing, and ultimately hear the word of God. 
And then we should go home and read the Word of God ourselves. But I think church attendance is very important. So do you think it's important to raise your kids on the gospel? Now, do you need to do these things? No. It's up to you. But do you think it's important to raise your grandkids on the gospel of Christ? And I said, the foundation of truth. And I would say it is the second most important decision you will ever make in your life. For the first is receiving Jesus as your Savior. Once you're saved, you need to make sure your kids, grandkids, and great king, grandkids are saved. And I encourage you to bring your kids to church. I have some tremendous Sunday school teachers. Bring your grandkids to the youth group and get involved. There's nothing greater than knowing your family saved. Let me look at this for a second. This 3 John 1, 4. And if you're a dad, a mom, and we're speaking of truth, look at this. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. They're believers. How great is that to know your child? No matter what happens here on earth, you know your child's going to heaven for they have received Christ. The question is, if you've not accepted Christ your Savior, I would say, do it right now. If you're not raising your child, grandchild, or great-grandchild on the gospel of Christ, I would say, do it now. Bring them out to church. Get them involved. If you're not saved, look at my hand up here. I want to show you something. Let this hand here uh, recognize you, uh, represent you and I in this wallet. It represents our sin. God loves us. He hates our sin. Hates it. Isaiah 59 says there's a barrier between us. Romans 3.23 says fall for all of sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says there's none righteous, no, not one. Wages of sin is death. We have grave sites all around the world that shows that we're all sinners. The human body dies because of sin. Yet people say, oh, I'm no, I don't sin anymore. Then you know what? We don't, they would live forever. They're sinners. They're going to die. It's a proof. It's a fact. We all die. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He's the lamb without blemish, without spot. God from eternity past revealed himself in the flesh, and he went to the cross, and he loved each and every one of you. And he shed his blood for each and every one of you. And then he died, and he resurrected to show us the payment for sin is paid in full. And why not believe that? In a world that has all these lies and many shades of gray and all these hypotheses, why not believe the truth and one absolute in your life that you can know you have eternal life? Why not trust in that? Why not believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and resurrected for you? Because if, when you do that, you receive his righteousness. You're born again and forever child of God, born into his family. That is truth. So Daniel, we spoke a little bit on truth here because in Daniel, he, you're going to hear a little bit about true and truth. Last couple chapters here. So Daniel received a vision and it was true. When you read the Word of God, it's based on truth and the Word of God is true. This prophecy is related to the next two chapters, so 11 and 12. Ultimately, they go hand in hand. Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. So we read in Daniel 8.27 that these visions sometimes made Daniel physically ill from what he had heard and understood. Three. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Daniel is mourning. He's grieving from what he had heard and understood and not engaging in the physical pleasures of life. Four. In the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekiel, Daniel was grieving for three full weeks. Remember the first month. We need to remember that. We studied that last chapter. The first month is the month of Nisan. That is the Passover month. That is the month Jesus Christ went to the, the cross of Calvary. 
It's significant when we read the first month of the Jewish year. This is the month of Nisan, which is the month Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins, burial, and resurrection. And people say that Jesus is not in the Old Testament. Well, let's look at verse 5 and 6. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the burl. His face was the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like the color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Turn over to Revelations 1. Makes you want to sing. Verse 11, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of a man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flame of fire. His feet like under the fine brass, and they burned into a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was into the sun, shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the, the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So I see a clear example here in Revelations 1 to the same as in Daniel 10, verses 5 and 6. We read verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. The men that were with Daniel were sore afraid. They ran, hid themselves, and they didn't see the vision. 8. Therefore I was left alone, and saw the great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. How great the vision was, it drained all the energy out of Daniel. He stood there lifeless, basically in awe. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Daniel standing with all energy drained out of him, yet he has enough energy to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. Daniel hears the voice of his words and immediately falls prostrate to the ground in a deep sleep. 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me up, my knees, and upon the palm, palms of my hands. So he's on his knees and his hands now. And I believe at this time an angel touches him. This is, again, Daniel's physically touched and signed up so he can understand what's being taught to him. Angel again touching him and explaining things to him. 11, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am now sent, for when he, for when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. The angel begins to explain, and we can see the, how the love of our Father Jesus Christ has for Daniel. For the angel calls him greatly beloved the angel stands Daniel up and tells him to understand what's being said or taught, understand the word of God. And we know that Daniel was terrified. Verse 12, then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And I have come for thy words. Daniel terrified. The angel gives Daniel a direction, basically to calm down. 
angel begins to tell Daniel, the minute he began to pray, his prayer was heard, thy words were heard. The angel was sent back to give Daniel answer to his prayer. And as you sit here today, we, when we pray, like you said, we go through the intercessor, Jesus Christ, and our Father sits on the throne, and we pray. We, our Father, who sits in the third heaven, hears our prayer. Jesus Christ goes to him on our behalf. You don't think that's a privilege? That is a privilege to hear. But we're going to read about a spiritual battle, and I don't think we, we oftentimes talk about the spiritual battle, but we're going to see the spiritual battle happening now. Verse 13. He says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. See, the true force behind these Gentile nations, behind Babylon, you know, behind, you know, Medo-Persia, Greece, and I would say all these Gentile nations, you can name them all, are just demonic forces. An angel was sent to give Daniel the answer, and immediately these demonic angels or fallen angels try and distract or keep an angel from getting to Daniel. Daniel mourned or grieved for 21 days, and it was during this entire time this angel was wrestling with demonic forces. So maybe you answered prayer. Maybe you're like, you know what, God's not hearing me. He's hearing you. But we need to remember there is a spiritual warfare, warfare happening out there. And ultimately, we just need to continue to pray. 14, he says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the later days, for the, yet the vision is for many days. Demonic forces, we need to know, they don't win. They're on the losing side. The angel rises and he gives, and he comes to make Daniel understand the later days. Daniel's given confirmation that the later days is many days from now, ultimately later days from Daniel's time. Probably the end times for us. We're probably in those later days. Verse 15. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. He had nothing to say. He was not able to speak one word. 16. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, not a capital L, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. So Daniel is standing there in awe, speechless. He's in awe for now, and he understands the spiritual battle that is happening before us. He understands the continued persecution and destruction of Israel. Then the angel reaches out and touches his lip, giving him permission to speak. Daniel says, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me and I've retained no strength. He's deeply grieved, he's ill, and he's in pain, for it hurts him to see this and understand this. 17, for how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me straightway there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Daniel's saying he's not worthy of this discussion. He also says there's no strength or life in him. 18, then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man and he strengthened me. Daniel again is touched and at this time he's given strength, 19. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee, be strong. Yes, be strong. And when, when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. So this angelic being tells Daniel again, he is beloved, tells him to fear not, and he tells him to be strong. And notice, Daniel is strengthened by the word. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And we all have the power of the word of God right here, truth, true. Any remedy that you have, any type of illness or what's bad, mental health or things going on in your life, I believe all remedy is in this book right here. Truth, true. 
go home and read it because you know what? When you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling, you know, apathy in your life, when you feel lethargic, when you feel nothing's going right, when you feel all hopelessness and you turn on the news and there's more hopelessness and you know what? More bills come in the mail and you feel even more hopelessness. You don't have the strength. You don't even feel like you can get out of bed. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. We could be strengthened by the word of God every single day. Yes, it's important to come to church. But you know what? You can get strengthened every single day reading the word of God at home. Because you know what? You will not find strength in this world. You'll find lies and more lies, which ultimately will deplete your strength. 20. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia will, shall come. So the Gentile nations, here we see it, have demonic forces behind them, moving and directing to a beast system. A new world order where the beast and Satan is worshipped. Something that we've seen in ultimately this, this statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. All these dreams and night visions that were interpreted by Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. We know now these Gentile nations were, as we had studied, were moved by demonic forces. And 21. And here's where more encouragement comes in. He says, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. And I end with this. So as noted in the scripture of truth, which we know is the Bible, not, you know, the Book of Mormon, not, you know, the Koran, not, you know, the apostasy with the 14 additional books that were written in 380. It is the word of God, the scripture of truth, which we know is the Bible, and then we know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the head of this angelic army, and that fights against this demonic world. And we need to know that we fight from victory. That is truth. We know that we have eternal life, which is truth. We know that salvation is received by grace through faith, which is truth. And I love that in verse 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. So in a world that has much lies and deception and many shades of gray, we can get affirmation, encouragement, and be strengthened in the word of God, for it is truth. And you know what? Thank God some man did not write this. Thank God it is God-breathed words, and only God could give us strength, and only God can be truth. And I'm so thankful for the word of God. And I mean, uh, I don't probably read it enough. But we should be the most valuable thing that we have. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we're just, maybe somebody's sitting here today and feeling hopeless, not, not much thing, Everybody around them is lying to them. But you know, they can come here today and understand that Jesus Christ loved them over and over in the word of God. It tells us how much that Jesus Christ loves us. He loves us so much that he died for each and every one of us. And he resurrected to show us the payment for sins paid in full. Maybe today that person can understand and be like, wow, how great is that? The gift of eternal life. I could never, re never ever lose it. All I have to do is believe that. All I got to do is believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and resurrected for me. And I say, yeah, that's it. That's what the word of God says. That's what truth says. That's why Christ came. He became sin for us. So maybe today, maybe that person can be like, right now, accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Believe that Jesus died for them and resurrected for them. They're trusting in Jesus Christ to save them right now. And they can say, Father, thank you for eternal life. Thank you, Father, for they've just been born again. And Father, to your children here, you know, what encouraging, you know, in the world as, even as children of God, we, we sometimes 
get discouraged, get caught up into the world. And ultimately we know, we are reminded over and over that you are truth, you are true. And ultimately that we can find encouragement in the world that we, we're just continued to be let down over and over but we can be strengthened through the Word of God. We can be encouraged through the, through the Word of God. And that we, our prayers, you know, go directly to the throne of grace through Christ. He delivers them right to the Father for us. How great is that? And ultimately know that sometimes our prayer doesn't get answered right away to, rem to be remembered of the spiritual warfare that's happening out there, that's going on. Ultimately, it may probably terrify us. Maybe Daniel even saw them. That's why he was scared, you know, the, to see the spiritual warfare happening. But ultimately, we are told to not be scared. We fight from victory. We need to continue to pray. We need to continue to read the Word of God and be strengthened through the truth. And you know what? All other abominations, all other salvation by works are abominations under the world. And you know what? We need to speak up and let people know it's a false doctrine. We need to speak the truth and stand on the truth, which is Christ. And Father, we're just so thankful for the many people that come out and support the church every single week. We just pray that you'd bless the youth group coming up, bring many people out, bring the kids out, because we, we, we know when the gospel's preached, people get saved. So we pray that you'd bring many kids out, young men and women, where they can come and hear the greatest gift, the gift of eternal life, and people could be born again right then and there receive Christ. And Father Carla and myself are traveling to Chicago. We just pray that you would put it on the people's hearts to keep us in prayer today as we travel to and fro from Chicago and come back tomorrow night. We just pray that you'd be with our workers in the county that are out there working hard, diligently to keep our roads safe. They'd keep them safe, Father. And we just pray that you would, you know, ultimately keep these families warm, the ones that have no power and ultimately that we can count our blessings. And through this time that we light candles, men, instead of turning on lights, that we could pull our Bibles out and read them through candlelight. Who knows? But we just pray that you would keep them safe, secure, keep everybody a hedge of protection around us, and bring us all back next week after Thanksgiving where we can continue to give thanks for what you did for us on the cross of Calvary. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody stand and turn to page 314.